Not a matter of if, but when a crisis could turn your world upside down. I'm Roshini Rajkumar, crisis strategist, licensed attorney, and host of The Crisis Files. In each case file, we explore a real crisis or a ripped from the headlines controversy. My crisis squad and I are here to find solutions. Our suggestions and those of our guests are meant to empower you to handle your own crisis or prevent crises from happening. We do not provide legal, financial, medical, or PR advice for particular situations, but strongly recommend you seek out professionals to help your specific need. A special treat today as we meet our guest expert on wellness, Jamie Martin. Jamie is the editor-in-chief of Experience Life, an award-winning health and fitness magazine that boasts more than 3 million readers and is connected to the Lifetime brand. She's here for the case file I call Burnout and Bust. The crisis? Burnout. No one is immune. Employees are experiencing burnout at ever higher rates, affecting not just their performance, but also that of the organizations where they work. Hard to avoid bad effects on personal lives, too. Jamie, can you frame the depth of this issue for us? Of course. And, you know, I don't think any of us you mentioned are immune to this issue. I've personally experienced burnout myself. We can talk a little bit about that. But even prior to the pandemic, you know, going on three years ago, many people in the workplace were already experiencing burnout. In fact, we had just published an article in Experience Life magazine in March of 2020, prior to all of this, that featured a statistic from a 2018 Gallup poll that 23 percent of employees at that time were saying they were experiencing burnout out always or often in the workplace. Another 44% were saying that that was happening some of the time. Now, fast forward nearly four years later from when that last poll was done, and a new 2022 Asana study has shown that of the 10,000 people who were surveyed across seven countries, 70% of employees were saying that they had experienced burnout in the last year. And that has major health effects for all of us. It really does. So that is an astronomical figure. What does burnout really mean? So burnout is really a state of physical and emotional exhaustion that's happening. It's a feeling of alienated from your work, which can create depersonalization. It can help you kind of create a sense of cynicism also about your work. Also, it bleeds into your personal life. You know, it can create listlessness and feeling of a lack of motivation. Even more than that, it feels like you're disconnected from the purpose of what you're doing. And so this was all defined back in the 1970s by a researcher, but it continues to grow and become a bigger issue in our modern world. World. It seems like we're working 24-7. Media is on all the time. We're exposed to things and it can feel overwhelming and like it's just all too much. And it seems like when we overwork our bodies, they can only do so much, right? right. Our bodies at some point are going to give out. What are some examples of that giving out? So because of the nature of burnout, it's exhaustion, right? So when we're feeling exhausted, that has a trickle-down effect on other areas of our lives. Not only that, cardiovascular health can be affected. We have depression and anxiety is on the rise as a result of this. There's some substance abuse issues. Some people are struggling with as a result of it. They do that to cope, to kind of get through the feeling of there's so much all the time. But really, it can create inflammation in your body when you're constantly stressed out. Chronic stress creates chronic inflammation in your body, and that has a trickle-down effect into all sorts of areas of health. It can lead to certain chronic health issues, thinking about type 2 diabetes, heart issues, as I already mentioned, you know, even certain types of cancers when chronic stress is existing and chronic inflammation in your body. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, stress is just that word that's become a nasty mm -hmm. word for us. There are so many ways to de-stress, but it seems that that even with people going back to the workplace or some kind of hybrid situation happening in a lot of workplaces, a lot of people are still staying at home and working from home. But being at home doesn't mean they're more relaxed. Absolutely not. I mean, I can personally speak from experience. When I was working from home for the majority of the early part of the pandemic, I felt like I was working more than ever. There was no start time and end time. It work bled into every area of my life. And I know there were points where I wasn't stepping away. It felt like I was working around the clock. I would step away for a lunch, but go right back to work. That's the problem that we're experiencing is when there are no boundaries. So we're in it all the time. And because of our devices, where they're constantly at our fingertips, email is right there, texting is right there. Many of us have programs like Teams where they're chiming in on our phones. So we're never really disconnected. So we're constantly feeling overwhelmed by all the responsibilities that are on our plate. So physical and emotional exhaustion, yes. some of the symptoms, some of the really bad results of burnout, alienation from work seeps into other areas of our life. So talk about alienation. 
Again, it doesn't have to just be because you're working from home and you're not around coworkers. Alienation can happen for a lot of reasons. Well, absolutely. And it's feeling alienated from even the content of the work that you're putting out in the world. You're feeling disconnected from this project over here. You're going through the motions versus feeling really invested in what you're producing. And that's just because there's just too much or it can feel like there's just not enough support there. And so that's a, an element of the alienation that happens. It's not just from the people around you. It is from the actual work that you're trying to put out into the world. All right. So let's talk about some of the solutions. Yes. All right. We always hear that if alienation is an issue, you should reach out, you should call someone. But people also feel guilty or a little stigmatized to even share that they're feeling overwhelmed. Yes, but that's part of the opportunity that we have is to share that we're not alone. Obviously, with that statistic, 70% of us saying that we felt burnt out to some degree, to let people know where we're at, to be willing to talk about it and to make this not the thing that's over here and being swept under the rug. We have to talk to people and ask, like, how can they support you? But also, well, how can we brainstorm solutions together to make this more feasible and not just feasible, but enjoyable? We want to get back to the joy of this and not just feel like like we're going through the motions. You mentioned mental health issues, substance yes. abuse issues. I know you and your team at Experience Life talk to a lot of experts. Yes. What is step number one that someone can do if they feel like, I need to talk with someone either about possible abuse, whether it's substance abuse, something else, as well as just needing to get help for any kind of mental health crisis that might be going on? Well, first and foremost, it's knowing you're not in it alone again, but talking to a healthcare provider as soon as you can to understand, like, what's the degree? Is this an official diagnosis or what kind of support do you need? We don't always advocate for pharmaceuticals for everything, but there is a time and a place and they have real impact on people. I will share, like, you know, that's one thing when I was feeling burnout personally, and it was extending for, you know, several months on end. It was like talking to my healthcare provider was my first step. But then also reaching out to help, for whether it's a psychologist or a therapist at another point, to be able to talk through what you're experiencing. There are so many resources, and I know that there's mental health crisis that's happening. A lot of people are saying it's really hard to get in and talk with a mental health expert, but I think there are telehealth opportunities now. So reaching out and not being afraid to just raise your hand and say, I need some support here. Let's talk about the workplace because yes. so many things have changed. A lot of people will say employees are really in the driver's seat right now mm -hmm. and employers, companies are having trouble finding workers. But when you talk about this crisis of burnout that you and I are discussing, it doesn't necessarily mean employees are in the driver's seat if they're burned out. So how can they do some fixes at work? So I think the first step is talking with your team, your leader about where you're at and saying, how do we brainstorm solutions around how this becomes more balanced? How can we find meaning? Maybe there's a shift in role or responsibilities, looking for opportunities that are maybe outside of what you're currently doing to reignite your passion for what you're doing. Because there's that disconnect with meaning in many cases. So is there a way to reconnect with that meaning in the work that you had before? How do you get back to that? Or are there ways to step into new roles or responsibilities that kind of light that fire and help you move through the burnout and get and you excited again. Talk, Jamie, a little bit about guilt, because mm -hmm. I always say it's a wasted emotion. Yes. How can people just lose the guilt and realize, hey, you're doing something that's good for you or good for me, good for mm -hmm. my family? And that's always a positive. Right. I think it's either guilt or sometimes people will say it's shame, not wanting to say that this is, you know, going on. And so really it's the acknowledgement of that being there, but then talking about it. We have to share where we're at if we really want to move beyond the issue that we're experiencing. When we're hiding it, when we're holding it in, that's only hurting us more internally. And so how do we share where we're at so that we can move forward and move out of that shame and that guilt for feeling like, oh, I'm in the wrong here. I shouldn't feel this way. But what we're feeling is somewhat normal. I mean, we've been through a really hard period of time. We have to understand that it's going to take time to come out of this. So giving ourselves the grace and the patience as we move through this, because it's not going to flip a switch overnight. There's no such thing. We always say at the magazine, no such thing as quick fixes. We have to find sustainable solutions. And what does that look like? Is it you know, finding different roles and responsibilities in your job, is it come to a point where it's time to look for a new opportunity because it's just not the right thing anymore? You're not lit up by it. We've talked about there's a lot going on with the great resignation. A lot of people have found they want to find deeper meaning in their work they're doing. That might be part of the burnout for some people. It's just not feeling connected anymore. So it might mean finding something new or seeking out new opportunities, networking with other people to find new opportunities. And it seems like there's less of a stigma right now 
if you do have a gap, like you've decided I'm going to just take some time yep. away, whether it's focus on my kids, focus on, you know, travel, whatever it mm-hmm. is. And there's less of a stigma that you're really ruining your career by taking six months or a year away from that track you were on. Absolutely. Speak to that a little bit. Well, I think there's, you know, some people are just deciding, like, I need to take this time. I have a colleague, for instance, who experienced a furlough for instance, in the pandemic. And it really gave him time and opportunity to figure out what he wanted to do next. And so if there's an opportunity for us to choose to step away and do that, you have to be really intentional about figuring out what's the next thing. How do I find my why? What are those things that have lit me up and gotten me excited before? And how do I connect that to the skills and talents that I already have? But it's giving yourself permission to know that this period of time might be different. Your financial resources might be different. You're going to have to look at what your circumstances are. But knowing that there's no shame and saying, I am ready for something new and I can be more intentional about my next choice and my next phase. And I don't want to forget the exercise piece in this because I even find, you know, in my situation, I'm sometimes at home working. I'm sometimes with clients. I'm sometimes out of town for client gigs. But I find even just the maybe three times during the workday that I take the dog out for five to 10 minutes at a time is a nice break. That's not even heavy exercise. No, it's really movement is so good at just helping us clear our minds, whether it's like intentional exercise. I'm doing a workout for 30 minutes or it's the walk around the block with your dog. That's a great example of one of the day to day things that we can do to help us move through burnout. You know, talking about changing a job or shifting your responsibilities, that might take more time and effort. But there are lifestyle choices we can make in the day to day that really can affect and help us move through burnout. You know, sleep is one of them. You know, sleep is such an essential component of health. But then there's, you know, we talk about completing the stress cycle. Movement is one way to do that. If we're feeling really stressed out, think about back in the day when you were being chased by a tiger. You didn't just sit there and wait. You had to run and get away. And that movement helped you complete what was called the stress cycle. So if we're feeling really stressed out, really burned out, Our temptation might be to sit back, to kind of hunker in on the couch and turn on a show and do that. But if we get up and move even for a little bit, that can make a huge difference in our health and well-being. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. And even better if you can find forms of movement that bring joy versus feeling like an obligation. Really great point. Thanks to our guest, Jamie Martin, editor-in-chief of Experience Life magazine. And speaking of sleep, in a few weeks, Jamie will be back to talk about the crisis that is sleep deprivation. Today's Crisis Brief brought to you by Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Number one, reshape your job if possible. Find your why of work. Number two, prioritize your health, including sleep and exercise. Number three, be social. Reach out to your network for support. Chances are they could use you around too. Reputation issues can arise quickly and unexpectedly. Prepare and plan before a crisis strikes with Goff Public, an award-winning public relations and public affairs agency. Your best defense is a crisis-ready culture that helps you spot potential issues, act swiftly, and reflects your brand's values while building trust with your audiences. Learn more at GoffPublic.com. Thank you to my podcast co-producers, Tom Hamilton of Undertone Music and Kim Inslee. Want us to weigh in on your crisis? Email me, Rashini at RashiniGroup.com. That's R-O-S-H-I-N-I at RashiniGroup.com. I'm Rashini Rajkumar. Join me next time on The Crisis Files. <laughs>